Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the 23rd Annual New Jersey Department of Transportation Research Showcase. This year's virtual event will have two parts, a morning plenary session and an afternoon of concurrent breakout sessions. I would like to take just a few minutes to go over some logistics. If you are having any issues using this site, there is a how to use feed loop video in the lobby area, or you can use the help button on the left as well. All attendees will be muted during the event. You will be able to communicate with each other and the speakers through the chat feature. To ask a question to the moderators, please use the chat feature. The chat will be monitored. Please comment with respect. All attendees will not have access to use their cameras during the event. During the afternoon, you will have the ability to move from one breakout session to the other. The moderators will be monitoring the question and answer feature during those sessions for questions for the presenters. After the event, recordings and presenta presentation files will be available on the NJDOT technology transfer website. Three professional development hours will be awarded for full attendance at today's program. That means you're required to be on the platform for a minimum of three hours to receive credit. Attendance certificates will be sent via email after the event. If you're only present for the morning session or only present for the afternoon session, you will receive a certificate for that portion only. Without further delay, let's begin our program. I would like to introduce New Jersey Department of Transportation Director of Division of Statewide Planning, Andrew Swords. Andy leads the team responsible for several transportation planning functions, including long range and performance based planning, safety planning and programs, the bicycle and pedestrian and complete streets program, congestion analysis, air quality planning, the Transit Village Initiative, State Planning Commission Coordination, and the department's research program. Andy has 33 years of experience with the NJDOT and is licensed as a professional planner in the state of New Jersey. I will now turn the program over to Andy. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and welcome to New Jersey DOT's 23rd Annual Research Showcase. I hope this greeting finds you healthy and safe. I'm Andy Swords, Director of Division of Statewide Planning. On behalf of Assistant Commissioner Michael Russo, I am pleased to welcome you all to this special annual event. Our research showcase will provide an opportunity for New Jersey's transportation community to experience the broad scope of academic research being conducted by our institutions of higher education partners and their associates. It will also highlight the benefits of New Jersey DOT's own transportation research program. This year, we will not only highlight the benefits of research, but also the resultant innovations that will help the transportation community meet the challenges of tomorrow. The theme of this year's research showcase is smart transportation, building a better future. As today's agenda will illustrate, this theme could not be any more timely. As we all know, a reliable transportation system in New Jersey is critical to the movement of people and goods along the Northeast Corridor and the backbone of New Jersey's economy. In addition, the transportation sector is working to provide cleaner options in order to reduce the motor vehicle emissions that contribute to air pollution and global warming. In support of this, today we will be exploring how research and innovation are addressing emerging challenges. And later this morning, we will be having one of my favorite items on the agenda, the 2021 Research Showcase Awards. 
I would like to acknowledge the folks that make it all happen. Today's program is organized by the New Jersey DOT Bureau of Research in partnership with the New Jersey Local Technical Assistance Program at Rutgers University, Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Transportation. I would like to thank the Research Bureau's manager, Amanda Gendek, and the Bureau of Research staff. I am proud to have them as part of the team in our Division of Statewide Planning. I would also like to thank their LTAP partners under the leadership of Janet Lilly at Rutgers Kate. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge our research partners and express my gratitude for the value they bring to New Jersey DOT's research program. Without the efforts of the university staff, our principal investigators, and all the students and grant administrators, we wouldn't be here today to showcase our collective success. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge a few people for their ongoing support. First, thank you to Commissioner Diane gutierrez Gachetti, Assistant Commissioner Andrew Tenard, and Assistant Commissioner Snehal Patel for your attendance today. Thank you to the Federal Highway Administration Division Administrator Robert Clark and your dedicated staff at FHWA New Jersey Division Office for your continued sponsorship of this program. I would also like to, like to thank Federal Highway's Helene Roberts for her contributions to the department's innovation efforts, including her active involvement in the STIC Council. And thanks to you, today's attendees and presenters, for taking the time to participate. Research has always been the means to cultivate the innovations necessary to sustain New Jersey's transportation infrastructure today and in meeting newly emerging challenges moving forward into the future. I hope you all enjoy today's session. Before I turn it over to the commissioner, I have an update to her message. I want to acknowledge panelist Julia Rieg Vice President for Energy and Environment of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation for joining our panel today. So without any further delay, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you our Commissioner of Transportation, Diane Gutierrez Scacchetti. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for your participation in this important event where we envision the future of transportation and literally take innovative ideas and bring them to the streets to improve the communities that we serve. I'd like to start by thanking David Maruka for your work in planning and hosting this important event. I'd also like to recognize Mike Russo, NJDOT's Commissioner of Planning, Multimodal and Grant Administration, and your team for all that you do to move NJDOT's initiatives forward. It is truly an honor for me to be here with this distinguished group. Since 1999, the New Jersey Department of Transportation has been hosting an annual research showcase where New Jersey's transportation community, the planners, designers, engineers, and academia meet with federal, county, and local transportation experts to bring the public and private sectors together to plan for the future. This event is about information sharing, or as many call it, transferring knowledge to individuals, groups, and organizations. It is about sparking new ideas and innovation through technology and transforming transportation and its infrastructure for everyone's benefit. Today, the greatest challenge facing our industry, in fact, what every industry faces, is how we will work collectively to reduce our impact on the planet and address long-standing problems with climate change. Climate change is real. Here in New Jersey, like so many other places across the country and around the world, we have experienced its devastating effects firsthand. Residents throughout the state are still recovering from Tropical Storm Ida's rain and flash floods that washed out roads and bridges, destroyed homes and businesses, and took the lives of more than 50 people in our region. Ida came on the heels of Tropical Storm Henri, 
and Elsa, which also wreaked havoc and resulted in the loss of life. Extreme storms, tornadoes, floods, drought, and fires have all increased in number of occurrences and intensity over the years. That is why Governor Murphy has made it a priority to reduce carbon emissions through vehicle electrification, smart transportation, and efficient energy use, which is the theme of today's showcase. Last year, the Murphy administration announced a goal that by 2035, all cars sold in New Jersey would be electric vehicles. This is a major component of the state's objective of reducing carbon emissions in New Jersey by 80% by 2050. Reducing carbon emissions is more vital than ever to the well-being of the public. Today, we are all part of the solution. The academic research we will hear about today will explore new opportunities to improve the environment by reducing emissions while continuing to provide a safe and cost-effective transportation network for decades to come. That is the focus of our keynote speaker, Jane Cohen. She is Governor Murphy's Senior Advisor on the Environment and Clean Energy and will provide insight on New Jersey's climate action and the green economy. Climate change is a global problem that requires a global solution. Every public, private, and academic organization must come together to find solutions and act upon them. We will hear from Peg Hanna, Assistant Director of Air Monitoring and Mobile Sources for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and how the environmental community is approaching the effects of transportation emissions on air quality. Dr. Ellen Kornheiser, Princeton University Professor of Operations, Research, and Financial Engineering, will provide insight into how academia are viewing the problem and solution equation. And Spencer Reeder, the Director of Government Affairs and Sustainability at Audi of America, will provide an industry view on promoting green initiatives. At NJDOT, you will often hear about our commitment to communities initiative. While I don't want to take the thunder out of Deputy Commissioner Andrew Tenard's presentation, I am incredibly proud of his leadership and the joint effort made by all of the state's transportation agencies to develop vehicle electrification and emissions reduction plan to meet the goals established last year by the governor. NJDOT, assisted by Princeton University graduate students, has been planning for the installation of 90 charging stations at our Ewing, Mount Arlington, and Cherry Hill facilities. We are currently working with utility companies to build out the necessary electric infrastructure to support that many charging stations. Across all the transportation agencies, NJDOT, the New Jersey Turnpike Authority, South Jersey Transportation Authority, and New Jersey Transit, we will build more than 300 charging stations. The agencies also plan to convert about 386 light duty vehicles over to electric or electric plug-in hybrid vehicles by 2025, which is about 40% of the fleet. By 2035, the goal is to electrify the entire light duty fleet. Andrew will share more of the details during his presentation, but it is another example of the effectiveness of public, private, and academic partnerships when working towards common goals. NJDOT has used partnerships in deploying intelligent transportation systems and connected vehicle technology, as you'll hear later today. Through an FHWA grant, the department with the New Jersey Institute of Technology developed a real-time feed of our safety service patrol vehicle locations to Waze in support of the state's move over law. If you are unfamiliar with the safety service patrol, it is a free service that provides roadside assistance to drivers who become disabled on our state highways and provide safety for our first responders at crash scenes. We have partnered with the College of New Jersey, Rutgers University, Cisco, and other state agencies to investigate how connected vehicle roadside units can work when included within adaptive signal systems. These roadside devices can send and receive data from vehicles, traffic signals, and other sources to create a technologically integrated transportation network. In addition to a developing smart technology, NJDOT is also implementing it. The Transportation Mobility Unit awarded approximately $30 million in construction contracts for fiscal year 2021 to deploy traditional intelligent transportation systems such as cameras and variable message signs, as well as more than 130 connected vehicle roadside units along Interstate 295, Route 1, and other corridors throughout the state. Moving forward, all adaptive traffic signal construction projects will include connected vehicle technology. All these initiatives must begin with a plan. This past summer, NJDOT launched an effort to create 
NJDOT's Connected and Automated Vehicle Strategic Plan. The department hosted two webinars to educate staff about connected and automated vehicles, followed by a workshop attended by every division to discuss how we, as a department, should embrace this new technology. One of the most exciting projects NJDOT is undertaking is a partnership with Rutgers, New Brunswick Development Corporation, and Middlesex County to create the New Brunswick Innovation Hub and Smart Mobility Testing Ground. It will be a five square mile living laboratory that will serve as a test bed for the future we're moving into with autonomous and fully connected vehicles. As we continue to grow the transportation network to include a diverse array of mobility modes, including bicycles to fully autonomous vehicles, we will use technology to make smart planning decisions. This living lab will be equipped with sensors to collect real-time data from vehicles, pedestrians, and infrastructure. We will be able to see how people are using connected and autonomous vehicle technology and how we can design better, safer transportation infrastructure that will support smart city solutions in connected vehicles. The data will be available to companies nationwide for free to encourage innovation and development. It is important to remind everyone that the data we collect and the privacy of our drivers will always be protected. The Innovation Hub is an exciting example of public, private, academic partnerships that will expand knowledge and encourage innovation. This showcase will again feature university students who are also envisioning the future of transportation. These next generation leaders will share their research on the Tech Transfer webpage for everyone to access and we will announce the one entrant selected to receive the Outstanding University Student in Transportation Award. We will also announce this year's winner of NJDOT's Build a Better Mousetrap Award. The award recognizes NJDOT employees who find innovative ways to do their jobs. Whether it's a new gadget that improves the quality and safety of a project or an innovative process that reduces costs and improves efficiency, typically the people on the front lines discover some of the best practices. Overall, the research showcase provides us with an opportunity to learn, share ideas, and create partnerships that will allow us to devise smart solutions that address environmental, energy, and transportation concerns, making tomorrow's transportation safer and more efficient and environmentally friendly than it is today. Thank you and enjoy the showcase. Thank you, Commissioner. We are very happy to continue the tradition of the Research Showcase event. I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Robert Clark, Division Administrator of the Federal Highway Administration, New Jersey Division Office. Robert became the FHWA New Jersey Division Administrator in June of 2013. He is the Principal Representative of FHWA in New Jersey and is responsible for administering the Federal Aid Highway Program in the state. Robert has been with FHWA for 19 years. Prior to that work, for, prior to that, he worked for the North Carolina DOT in a variety of positions. Robert holds a bachelor's degree in finance from Georgia Southern University and a master's degree in public administration from North Carolina State University. Here to deliver opening remarks on behalf of the Federal Highway Administration, Robert Clark. And good morning, and, and thank you for that introduction. Um, we're at a very exciting time in research right now. Um, between our new reauthorization, which I can't talk about, um, but you can read about, um, and what we're doing today, um, I'm here to talk about innovation and how each and every one of you can help Federal Highway and New Jersey Department of Transportation's quest to deliver products better, faster, smarter, and more resilient. Innovation is not something FHWA can do in a vacuum. It takes partnerships with industry, academia, government agencies at all levels, and the public, our primary customer. Federal support for R&D as a share of the economy has fallen nearly two thirds since the 1970s. Statistics from the National Foundation of Science to the federal government funds 57% of basic research. Business, however, 
puts the bill for the majority of applied research at 60% and development in 84% of the total. This shows that industry invests in the late stage of research where they stand to gain a profit while investing less in basic research where much of our innovation occurs. But the need for innovation, basic research and applied research has never been greater due to the deteriorating infrastructure, increasing demand for multimodal transportation services for highways, ports, aviation, and freight. Research is an integral part of the development of technology needed to help transportation needs. So regarding innovation, and more importantly, deploying innovation and technology. Federal Highway works with state departments of transportation to administer the research portion of the federal aid state planning and research program. In addition to providing stewardship and oversight of the SPR, FHWA works with state DOTs on the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, or NCHRP, which is a state-driven program to address issues integral to state DOTs. FHWA also administers the Transportation Pool Fund Program to encourage states to partner with each other and with FHWA to conduct research of common interest. On the ground here in New Jersey, FHWA supports our Transportation Innovation Council, or STIC, not only by providing best practices, but through actual funding. Over the past six years, New Jersey STIC has received almost $500,000 for initiatives like e-construction, data-driven safety analysis, unmanned aerial systems or drones, ITS beacon, the development of a STIC communication plan, training LPAs on the use of blue beam e-construction, and most recently to establish a pilot program to use crowdsourcing for operations. The last funding mechanism from FHWA that I'd like to share is our Advanced Innovation Demonstration Program. In 2017, New Jersey DOT applied for and received $322,000 for the Weather Savvy Roads pilot to remotely provide real-time information of the road maintenance fleet to traffic management centers. I'm proud to say that this project in 2021 won ITS New Jersey's Outstanding Project Award. The project provides remote real-time video streams and road sensing capabilities from the DOT fleet to statewide traffic management centers. This provides critical adverse weather information needed to proactively manage our roadway systems and specifically during winter storms, tropical storms, or hurricanes, like the Commissioner had spoken about earlier. I would also like to applaud New Jersey DOT and Rutgers Tate for their research project on the New Brunswick Innovation Hub Smart Mobility Testing Ground and hope that this project develops results and strategies that can be applied to other cities in our region. To close, for the past couple of years, FHWA New Jersey Division has included in the planning emphasis area for the MPO UPWPs, the topic of automated connected electric and shared use vehicles. The division encourages NJDOT and the MPOs to include these emerging technologies in their transportation planning processes. As smart technologies and vehicles become more prevalent, in the upcoming years, curbside management will be a challenge. FHWA. FHWA has recently published its curbside inventory report that provides an in-depth technical study pertaining to the collection, inventories, and processing of information relevant to existing conditions. With these tools, the advancement in transportation is bound to improve. Uh, once again, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, you have a great time. Please be safe and uh, thank you again. Thank you, Robert. I am now pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Jane Cohen. Ms. Cohen is the executive director of the New Jersey Governor's Office of Climate Action and the Green Economy. She is going to share with us her perspective and New Jersey's initiatives and successes in addressing climate change. 
Jane is a senior advisor to New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy, where she handles the environment and energy portfolio, leading work on the governor's clean energy agenda, environmental justice and climate resiliency work, and among other key initiatives. Prior to joining the governor's office, she was the policy director at Isles Inc., where she led strategy for a broad portfolio of policy issues, including lead poisoning prevention and healthy housing, urban air pollution, electrical vehicles, and workforce development in the green job sector. Prior to her work in New Jersey, Jane was a senior researcher for Human Rights Watch, where she helped launch the organization's environmental policy and human rights program and authored their first report on climate change. Jane holds dual master's degrees from Columbia University, a master's of international affairs and a master of public health. It is my honor to introduce Jane Cohen. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, David, for that introduction. And thank you for all the work that you and the Rutgers team have done in putting this fantastic program together. I also want to thank DOT. We've had uh, already seen uh, the commissioner, um, obviously, uh, Andrew Swords, and we'll hear from a number of other folks who are just doing amazing work at DOT. And I want to thank my partners at uh, DEP and all the other agencies that are working on how we are going to continue to confront climate change here in New Jersey. Okay, sharing my presentation. As David mentioned, I spent a lot of time working internationally on climate issues. And six years ago, I was standing on the banks of Lake Turkana uh, in northern Kenya, learning from farmers and herders about how because of climate change, they didn't have enough to eat, how their livestock and their crops were dying, and how the land, which had always been arid, was increasingly dry and lifeless. Now, the details of these conversations couldn't have been more different than where we are now in New Jersey but the themes are strikingly similar. That climate change threatens every aspect of our lives, that those who are already more vulnerable bear the biggest burden, and that to truly address climate change, we need both individual commitments and bold action from government. Now, over the last few years, there's really been an increasing understanding that we are in a crisis moment. A few months ago, the IPCC, which is a uh, subgroup of the UN, uh, of UN scientists, put out a report, which is called the Code Red Report, that's really detailing these irreversible, devastating, and swiftly approaching, and really actually here now, impacts of climate change. And it, uh, it really calls for um, urgent worldwide action. And I wanna just be clear here because these are you know, normally kind of staid scientists who are pretty much running around with their hair on fire saying we are in a crisis. Now, I think probably most people uh, know what the sort of big impacts are, but I think it's important to say it again, that we're looking at increasing heat waves, longer warm seasons, uh, shorter cold seasons, heavy precipitation, droughts, uh, reductions in Arctic sea ice, and many of these changes in the climate system are becoming larger in direct relation to increasing global warming. Now, what about here in New Jersey? So in 2020, our scientists at the Department of Environmental Protection put out the first ever scientific report on climate change. Again, detailing what we have, uh, uh, what, what we will be continuing to see as our impact. So more increased rain, more flooding. Um, we'll also have drought, more drought. Uh, our oceans are going to be becoming more acidic. Um, which will be posing a, a threat to our thriving fishing industry and lots of impacts to our ecosystem, uh, potentially affecting all of our habitats for our species. And it may become too hot for our state bird, the American goldfinch, to nest in New Jersey. 
uh, we're going to be seeing longer wildfire seasons um, and in uh, increased coastal flooding. Um, and we're expecting a pretty intense sea level rise, um, approximately uh, two feet by 2050 and five feet by 2100. So let's see what that looks like. This is Atlantic City today. This is Atlantic City in 2050 with two feet of sea level rise. And this is Atlantic City in 2100 with five feet of sea level rise. Now, 2100 could seem like a long time away. I don't plan on being alive then um, without some potentially creepy uh, technical advances, but my grandchildren, I would expect to be in their productive lives at that point. And when we think about all of the planning that we do for our children and our grandchildren, whether it's financial planning, education planning, we really need to be thinking um, as kind of the top priority, how we are planning for our climate future. Now, we care about emissions, not only because of its impact on climate, but also because of localized air pollution. As temperature increases, we're gonna see an, uh, an, intense, <clears throat> an increased intensity in air pollution. And we know that air pollution has a devastating impact on, on communities that are living within it, particularly respiratory and cardiovascular issues. And as you can see from this uh, map, many parts of New Jersey uh, are really struggling with pretty severe air pollution. Um, this, uh, this map from 2017 from the American Lung Association gives you know, multiple uh, counties an, uh, an F. And again, this is important because in our most overburdened communities, this is where we see the most severe impacts. So we can see that in Essex County and in Camden County, there's a higher rate of asthma than in the rest of the state. Because of this relationship between air pollution and between climate and environmental justice, we are really focusing so much of our work around environmental justice and equity and centering those in how we are approaching all of our work. And this should not come as a surprise to anyone who's working within a state agency. Governor Murphy has made it clear from the day he took office that environmental justice was going to be a big priority for him. And I think it's been pretty well socialized through the entire administration that we need to be really making sure that as we move our work forward, environmental justice and equity are really at the center. And I'm proud to say that in New Jersey, we really are the tip of the spear for environmental justice. This past year, the governor signed the strongest environmental justice law, which gives the DEP a tool to, to require uh, a special analysis within overburdened communities of facilities that want to go into those areas. So the DEP evaluates and sees if that facility will, will uh, result in uh, a negative impact on an already overburdened community. And if the answer to that is yes, the DEP must reject the permit. Now, I wanna be clear about something. This is not completely black and white in that the DEP wants to work with developers to see how that project can become more innovative, how that project can, um, how it can move forward in a way that does not impact the community. So it might be that trucks need to be rerouted re so they're not going through the community or that those trucks need to become electric trucks. There's a lot of different ways to have that discussion and it's it will force developers to really think about how to be innovative um, in this moment where we just cannot continue to emit um, in the way that we have been. Uh, this past June, I was on a bus tour with a number of commissioners, uh, the DEP commissioner, um, the executive uh, uh, chief officer of the EDA, our Department of Labor commissioner, uh, BPU president, the first lady. Um, we were on a tour led by Kim Gaddy, who I'm sure many of you know um, from Clean Water Action. And you know, you have a whole bunch of folks 
who are thinking about environmental justice, who are on this bus tour of Newark. And it was so striking to be taken through and really narrated all of these different spots, um, metal recycling, the port, and really seeing where there are these residential neighborhoods right next door. And it was, it was really a moment for everyone where it was very clear that, you know, this is much more than, than rhetoric and that it's really incumbent on all of us to turn that rhetoric into true action because this is people's lives. Okay, so here we have our problem at hand. There's an urgent need to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions across many sectors. Now, how are we gonna solve this complex problem? Well, coordination is really key. If you think about being in an electric vehicle, pulling up to your Wawa to charge that vehicle. Well, let's think about how many state agencies are involved in that. So we have our BPU that's thinking about the work with the utilities and the impact on ratepayers and the impact to the grid. Uh, our DEP, which is thinking about mapping all of that public infrastructure and tracking those emissions reductions. Our Economic Development Authority, which is really working to localize that supply chain here in New Jersey. And with our Department of Labor, thinking about all of the workforce that needs to come into this new green economy. Our DOT, which is thinking about how the state fleet should be interplaying with that public charging network. Um, our Department of Community Affairs, which is thinking about permitting. It's a huge amount of coordination. And that's just one piece of the clean energy agenda. When you multiply that across everything that we're doing, um, you realize that this is very complex and needs to be very carefully uh, coordinated. And that's why the governor last February created the governor's office of climate action in the green economy. And the purpose of this office is really to coordinate this policymaking and this implementation across all of the departments and agencies to make sure that we really are working in lockstep. One of the things that we are doing from my office is working with every agency and department to make it clear that New Jer Jersey's climate future really does depend on every agency's responsiveness to the realities of climate change. And I was really happy to hear the commissioner in her opening remarks talk so much about climate and so much about how DOT is really thinking through climate at every step, because that is exactly the thinking that we need. When it comes to transportation, transportation plays a very critical role here. It makes up globe, uh, in the US about one third of greenhouse gas emissions. And as we've seen in uh, Superstorm Standy, in Ida, um, transportation and infrastructures, long-term reliability and operations can be interrupted by the impacts of climate change. And here's just showing that in New Jersey, again, that transportation makes up just a huge amount of our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, we are really focused on transportation here in New Jersey. Um, you can see from this uh, uh, kind of cornucopia of reports that, that we have focused on this in a number of different uh, programs that we are working on. And we have a program in light duty, medium and heavy duty electric vehicles, our transit vehicles, and as the commissioner mentioned, um, our state fleet. So starting with our light duty electric vehicles, we have a goal of 30,000, having 30,000, 330,000, excuse me, um, light duty vehicles on the road by 2025. Now, as of December, uh, 2020, we had about 41,000. I would say that that number is probably closer to 50,000 right now. In any case, you can see that we really need to be getting more, more cars on the road here to, to hit that goal. In addition, our uh, 80 by 50 report that's put out by our uh, Department of Environmental Protection, um, their modeling showed that we need to have 100% of light duty sales be electric by 2035. So we have a long way to go here. We're working hard on it, but 
um, we really need to increase our, our sales in our light duty vehicles on the road. One way that we're doing that is through the BPU's uh, Charge Up New Jersey incentive program that gives about $5,000 um, of rebate when you purchase an electric vehicle. Now in the first uh, two uh, years of this program, uh, the money has been uh, used up very quickly. It's a very popular program and really indicates that there's a lot of interest in light duty ownership in New Jersey. Now, I'm sure everyone out there is familiar with kind of the chicken and the egg problem. You know, you have the EVs on the road, but you need the charging infrastructure. Do you get the infrastructure first or the cars first? Um, we are really working on both of those. We are pushing our EV charging network. We have pretty uh, robust goals and we're making a lot of progress towards them. But I will be the first to admit that range anxiety is a real thing. I have an EV and I have spent um, too much time white knuckled on the steering wheel with my children in the back seat, uh, really uh, hoping and praying for a charging station to come along. So I think it is really an issue. I mean, this is an issue that you know we are struggling with in New Jersey, but you know all states that are looking to um, really increase their electric vehicles are looking at exactly the same set of issues. Our medium and heavy duty sector um, is another place that we're putting a lot of focus. Um, we have a goal of having 30% of medium and heavy duty sales by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Now medium and heavy duty is, is tricky in a lot of ways um, and, and less uh, straightforward to figure out than light duty. Obviously the technology is a little bit different um, and the vehicles themselves are more expensive. Um, with light duty cars in general right now, there's supply chain issues, but the supply chain on the medium and heavy duty um, is also an issue that we're, that we're looking at. Our uh, New Jersey Transit bus electrification um, is moving forward and is really, really exciting. We have a goal of having 100% of new bus procurements by 2032, which would mean that we, by 2040, we have um, zero emission buses completely across, uh, across the fleet, which is great. Um, just last week, um, the board authorized the purchase of the first eight uh, zero emission buses uh, for New Jersey Transit for their Newton Garage in Camden. And those buses should be hitting the street um, Q2, 2022, Q3, um, and that'll be really exciting for us. And in general, New Jersey Transit is really looking at how to be more sustainable, how to um, be uh, more climate friendly, um, and there's a lot of exciting work going on there. And then finally, our state fleet electrification plan. Um, I will let Andrew Tenard, who's really been leading this work for DOT, uh, talk about this more in depth but we are doing a lot of thinking about the state fleet electrification, um, how to get that light duty state fleet electrified by 2035, um, and how to really integrate it into the general planning of our uh, light duty charging network across the state. Now, as I mentioned, all of this work requires a lot of coordination and on transportation specifically, we have the New Jersey Partnership to plug in, which is led by my office and has um, membership across you know, multiple state agencies. And the, the role of the partnership is to map uh, existing and planned infrastructure, to really coordinate these plans to install charging infrastructure throughout the state, to create new programs to increase EV adoption, awareness and acceptance, and to really enhance these existing initiatives. So it's a lot of work, um, but we have to do it in partnership. Um, and I think that you know we are really moving it forward in a very positive way. This headache inducing slide is really just to demonstrate that there is so much work going on across all the multiple different agencies. And I think it's, you know, many of you who are listening today are probably fairly in the weeds on this, um, but it is always interesting that there's so much more work and coordination that goes into um, really anything than most people realize. Um, and that is very much true in terms of our, 
uh, our, our clean energy and our climate work. Okay, so how are we approaching this um, from a kind of financial perspective? Um, so one of our big ways to fund this work currently is through our, uh, our regional greenhouse gas initiative proceeds, uh, our REGI proceeds. So REGI is our regional cap and trade uh, system. And um, by we are getting around 80 to $90 million a year in auction proceeds. We did a very uh, robust stakeholder process um, a few years ago. Um, and out of that, we decided um, as a state that we are gonna be focusing the lion's share of those proceeds on catalyzing clean, equitable transportation. Now, the three state agencies that are responsible for spending the REGI funds are EDA, who has the bulk of that uh, funding and shared with DEP and BPU. We also have our Volkswagen Mitigation Trust Fund that we've been using also to fund um, mostly uh, medium and heavy duty uh, uh, vehicles, but also some of our uh, light duty charging infrastructure. One of the big signature programs that we have funded through our REGI proceeds through our Economic Development Authority is the New Jersey Zero Emission Incentive Program, otherwise known as NJZIP. And the purpose of NJZIP is to provide vouchers to support the purchase of zero emission medium and heavy duty vehicles um, and to really bring it more into cost parity with a diesel vehicle. So we had a $15 million funding pool originally, a $5 million set aside for small and micro businesses where we know, you know that that funding gap is really much harder for those small businesses to make up. Um, we also had bonuses for um, minority women veteran owned businesses. Um, and the program is focused in environmental justice areas. So Camden and Newark. And just recently, because the program was so successful, we actually added uh, almost $10 million and expanded the program into New Brunswick. It's very exciting. Um, I think, you know, probably most of us have not seen many medium and heavy uh, duty vehicles in the wild. And this program is really gonna help increase our numbers. And also kind of increase socialization of the fact that you can have uh, an electric or a zero emission uh, medium and heavy duty vehicle. So another, um, an, another exciting project that we're funding um, is a e-mobility project in Trenton uh, through Isles. So as I think we're gonna be talking about more today and is really important for me as I think about all of our goals across the administration is how we can do projects that have a lot of co-benefits. So one of the issues in a lot of our urban areas and also our suburban and ex-urban areas is around transportation. And this is certainly the case in Trenton. So Isles has been doing a lot of work um, with workforce training. And one of the things that you know, they have come, come to know very uh, intimately is that they can do a lot of workforce training and they can help their uh, clients find employment. But getting those people to those jobs is actually very challenging. And so this project in Isles is really to combine those mobility issues that folks are experiencing in Trenton with, the, um, with electric vehicles so that we are both helping folks with mobility and also addressing our climate issues. And so there's a, a when it's fully operational, there will be an EV car share service. So for residents who are looking to use a car for an extended period of time, there'll be ride share for folks who are looking for a more affordable uh, uh, mode of transportation within the city. And there'll be EV, <clears throat> EV shuttle service. So that can connect major points of interest and essential services. So this is, again, it's just a pilot, but it's really exciting. Um, and I think folks feel uh, uh, really in inspired by it. Okay, so we've talked a lot about electrification, electric vehicles, but what about infrastructure and climate planning? And I wanna just take a step back because the commissioner mentioned this and a number of other folks have mentioned this already today, that we really need a lot of innovative ideas. 
we need to be sparking new ideas. And as I say a lot to my team and, and kind of across all the state agencies, we have to put our head on a little bit differently. We have to think beyond the status quo. And this doesn't just go for state agencies. This is true for businesses, for really for the private sector. I mean, everybody has to understand that the moment for the status quo has really come and gone. Um, and so when we talk about you know, planning, um, I'd really encourage everybody here to think about um, how we can, as I say, kind of turn our heads differently and really think about how we can use our dollars, use our planning to, um, to move forward these co-benefits that we need. So, um, and I think uh, Andy talked about this a little bit, but um, NJT has its complete streets policy, which really encourages public health and sustainability. Um, this is really important um, as we think about reducing VMT, which is, um, you know, something that there's a lot of discussion about how we can take, you know, more cars off the road and really increase other modes of transportation. Um, NJDOT's complete streets policy is very critical there. Um, and it allows us to think a little bit differently about these state investments and how to make sure as we are making these investments that we can really provide New Jersey residents with improved safety and expanded mobility. Also transit villages. Um, I'm proud to say that just last week, Newark was designated as a transit village. Um, it's the 34th municipality to be recognized as so since the program began in 1999. Um, obviously, um, this is something that's very aligned with what we are looking to do um, to address climate. Um, having the complete streets policy, having transit villages, it reduces our dependence on especially uh, passenger cars, which is, again, you know, the more we can get people out of their cars and onto, um, you know, transit buses, onto trains, um, onto bicycles, um, on their feet, all of that is, is really positive. And again, not just for the climate, but for health, um, reducing congestion. And that goes back to my original point about also reducing air pollution. Um, it improves air quality. Um, and increases transit ridership, which is which is another big goal. So, um, looking at expanding, you know, access to public transportation throughout the state, and really thinking about this transit village concept is really key. Now, resilient infrastructure is also very critical for us to be thinking about as we move into you know, more storms, more heavy precipitation, having a resilient and reliable infrastructure is, is just going to be very key. Um, and really understanding all these future hazards of climate change and, and linking up, you know, the work that we're doing over here with DEP and the, you know, report on climate change and the work that DOT is doing on planning and really understanding how we have to be thinking about that infrastructure to make it resilient. Those connections are just very key. And to be clear, DOT and DEP and all of our state agencies do have a lot of uh, communication and coordination, but we need much more across all of our state agencies. And again, across the private sector, academia, et cetera, to really make sure that we are prepared against these future risks. People talk a lot about green infrastructure and about stormwater. And I think it's really interesting to think about how much we as humans have really interrupted nature's process. Nature knows what to do. It knows what to do with stormwater, um, but we have built all around. And so when we think about these you know, heavy rain events and how we're gonna deal with stormwater, we have to be thinking about how we can be much more in harmony with nature. Now, I was the president of the environmental club in high school. So I know this sounds very tree huggerish, but from a policy perspective, it's really true that the more we go with 
what nature has intended us to do in terms of dealing with stormwater and being much more aligned with these natural processes, the more we'll really be able to um, adapt to the world that you know we, we are already in. Um, so I think this is a really interesting kind of striking graphic because it really does show what we've done to our natural environment and that you know the onus is on us to figure out how to kind of return as much as possible to these natural processes. When it comes to stormwater and green infrastructure, this is a place where our transportation agencies really play a very critical role in thinking about how to integrate some of this bread and butter transit and transportation work, whether it's you know repaving, resurfacing, thinking about how those pieces really need to be integrated with green infrastructure. So maybe it's um, making sure that every time we, we put in a new road or we do repaving that we're making sure to think through all of those kind of down the line impacts in terms of stormwater, putting in green infrastructure, whether it's a rain garden or you know a, a wetland or whatever it is, um, every case has to be different, but really making sure that that is integral into the planning process. And that's why I say we all have to put our heads on a little bit differently, that things that you know 10 years ago might have been kind of nice to haves now, today, need to be just very, very, very central to our planning process. Um, and that goes for, you know, not just kind of stormwater, but really there's a lot of um, planning and infrastructure that needs to be thought of in this way. Um, and I really encourage, um, you know, my, my colleagues kind of across state agencies to really be, be thinking about that. Obviously, you know, Ida, is a very tragic example of the fact that we do really need to be thinking about, um, you know, our stormwater uh, in the context of where we are today, that we know there are going to be more and more super storms, hurricanes, um, there's also going to be more inland flooding. So how are we going to be dealing with all of this? Um, and again, you know, this goes back to that kind of very central need to when we are planning to have all of these climate considerations be on the ground floor of those plans. So just to say again that, you know, stormwater is something that is just so integral to all of the planning processes um, and you know not just because of you know combined sewer overflow and other issues but also all of the uh, pollutants that come from runoff um, it's an environmental justice issue it's an equity issue and it's one that unless we really address um, we're just going to continue to see get worse and worse we are in a moment now that is truly all hands on deck. I don't have the answers. My colleagues in other states who are thinking about this for you know, their own states, they don't have all the answers. The private sector doesn't have all the answers. We all really need to be working in partnership. And you know, I love the build a better mousetrap concept because everybody has good ideas about how to address the multitude of issues around climate that are facing us now. And I really, really encourage all of you to kind of open up your thinking on, on these issues. And please contact me and others if you have ideas of pilots we should try or programs that we should be implementing or ways that we should be thinking about these issues differently because we're all trying to solve these kind of collective problems. And we really do need to be working completely in partnership. And so I would love to hear from folks who are, you know, out there today from academia, students, um, folks who may be listening from the private sector, and of course, our state agencies, um, so that, you know, five years from now, we're having a really different conversation than the one that we're having right now. So as we, um, move on to the rest of the the program today you know again i just really encourage you to 
um, not think like, oh, other people are working on this, but um, you know, what can I do? What can I contribute to this? Because it really truly is a moment um, where we need to take uh, everybody's best thinking and figure out you know, how we address these uh, very significant problems. So thank you very much um, and enjoy the rest of the, of the great presentations today. Thank you, Jane, appreciate that. And Jane, to your point, I'd just like to bring up, I was actually uh, at a friend's house up in West Amwell regarding Ida, the storm Ida. And he literally, uh, in I think he said a three hour span of time, got almost 14 inches of rain, which caused four feet of water to come into his residence. And literally there was debris all over his property. It was unbelievable. And he said he's been living there for 50 years and he's never seen anything like it to your point. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is what's what I think is scary is that we don't have a reason to believe that, you know, this is going to get better without a lot of without, you know, bold action on the mitigation side, but then really thinking about resilience. Absolutely. Uh, does anyone have uh, any questions? Anybody want to chat anything into Jane? We are ahead of schedule. If there's anything anyone would like to ask Jane, this is a great opportunity and we have the time. Uh, please chat it in at this time. Looks like Amanda has a question. Hi, can you all hear me? Thank you so much, Jane. Um, I just wanted to mention, you know, because you were stating, you know, we really need to think outside of the box and, and beyond the status quo. And what you said was inspiring. And I really want to remind everybody that is logged on right now. You know, there's a lot of researchers. There's, there's a lot of brilliant minds logged on right now. And I wanna remind everybody uh, that on our NJDOT tech transfer website, we have a portal where you can input any of your research ideas or um, examples of you know, things that we need to pilot, just like Jane said. Um, so if you go on our website, it's www.njdottechtransfer.net. And there's a tab at the top where it says, share your ideas. So if you go there, um, you know, type in your ideas and we will be sure to evaluate them and, um, and uh, consider them for funding. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a, a, a plug. <laughs> That's great, Amanda. I'm so glad that you have that. And I would say, you know, outside of that, again, you know, if you want to just kind of, you know, if you have a good idea and you want to talk about it, feel free to reach out to our office. Um, you know, it's, it's inspiring in both directions. So um, we do all need to work together here. Thank you. Okay, I don't think we have any questions coming in at this time. Um, with that in mind, it's now 10.05. We're gonna to stick to our schedule. So our next scheduled event is the panel discussion. That will take place at 10.40 a.m. So we're gonna give you a nice long break uh, to uh, relax, maybe even get something to eat and uh, come back. We will see you at 10.40 to start our panel discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for rejoining our program. Hopefully you had a nice little break there. Up next is our panel discussion on the current call to action and next steps in electrification of vehicles, smart transportation, and energy use. Our invited guests today represent a variety of sectors involved in the move towards vehicle electrification and green energy. Each of our five panelists will take some time to provide their own remarks, and then they will address several questions as a group we have asked each panelist to share with the audience their perspectives on the smart transportation and energy use 
from their vantage point since they represent a diverse group from regulatory agencies to research to industry. Our first panelist is Peg Hanna, Assistant Director of Air Monitoring and Mobile Sources for the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. In this capacity, Ms. Hanna oversees staff working on the state's air quality monitoring network, as well as staffing, uh, I'm sorry, as well as staff working on implementing a variety of strategies to reduce emissions from transportation. Peg has over 30 years experience with DEP and a bachelor's of science degree in biology from the University of Scranton. I am pleased to introduce Peg Hanna. Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful fall day, isn't it? And um, Jane Cohen's keynote speech was really, for me, um, inspirational and, and motivational in her call to action and her request for us to put on our heads a different way and, and meet the moment really, I think, sets the perfect tone for today's presentation um, for this panel. So let me just share my screen. Okay. There we go. So having raised two boys who are now adults, um, I know it's important to really answer the question of why before we talk about the what. And Jane touched on this already, but because they were boys, I think I learned the lesson that sometimes you need to say things not once, not twice, but sometimes three, four, five, six times before it sinks in. So I just wanted to start by um, repeating some of the statistics, but maybe um, slightly different quotes than Jane mentioned in her presentation. This is from the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that was released not too long ago, which the United Nations chief called a code red for humanity. The quote that jumped out at me is the one on the left here. It's unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years. That's a pretty startling statistic, if you ask me. I think what's also important to remember is that climate change not only affects the environment, but it also affects human health. And I love this graphic and um, uh, motion from the Center for D Disease Control because it really shows that there is a, uh, an exponential effect and a ripple effect um, for health impacts as well. 42% of our climate change emissions in New Jersey are coming from transportation. And that's why this panel is really key in addressing some of the goals and challenges that Jane outlined for us. However, I wanna remind everybody that we're still focused on the good old fashioned pollutants like particulate matter and nitrogen oxides, which cause ozone. We know that those pollutants have their own set of health effects and environmental impacts. We also know that diesel particulate matter is carcinogenic. But the good news is that if we electrify the transportation sector, not only are we addressing climate change, but we are also reducing these pollutants as well. <clears throat> the numbers and the um, units on the X and Y axis, he axis here are not really as important as the slope of the trajectory. And that's what I want you to look at today. So in order to meet our 2050 goals for climate change, which is reducing emissions 80% below our 2006 baseline by 2050, we need to have incredible amounts of light duty electric vehicles and medium and heavy duty electric vehicles on the road. For light duty, we're almost starting at ground zero, in my opinion. Jane's correct that we probably have about 50,000 uh, passenger EVs on the road today. We should have the new numbers out shortly. For medium and heavy duty, we have um, a handful, maybe a dozen. So basically starting at ground zero, and then look at, this, look at the uh, steepness of that slope. We all have um, a, really a lot to do, and working together is the only way that we're going to get there. So let's talk about innovation, since that is the theme of today's panel. When we talk about electric vehicles, we know that many residents of 
environmental justice communities don't own a vehicle at all. This graph demonstrates that, although it is a bit dated, I think the, the basic facts are still going to be the same. So if we acknowledge that residents in overburdened communities do not own a vehicle at all, and if they do own one, it's likely not going to be an electric vehicle, how do we close that equity gap? And how do we ensure that those residents also get the benefits of clean transportation? In my opinion, I think we need to curate a different approach for residents of those communities. And we're doing that through things like our electric shared mobility program grants. Um, these are competitive solicitations. We received a lot of great ideas this last round, and we are still analyzing them. But in the previous round of our solicitation, we awarded money for the IELTS project that Jane Cohen mentioned. And what was really impressive and important to me about the IELTS project is that they preceded their um, implementation of the project with information gathering. They made sure that they understood what the needs of their residents were. They made sure they understood what the transportation gaps were. They made sure that they were leveraging the skills and knowledge of those residents before they designed a program. So not only are they now able to create jobs and improve the workforce skills of the community, but they're also able to get those community members, once this program is launched, to their doctor's appointments, to their educational opportunities, to the grocery store, et cetera, using clean transportation. So thinking innovatively and outside of the box about making sure that we really do close that equity gap and provide all residents of the state, not just the, the general population with clean transportation is, is really something that we need to focus on. I think the other important innovation sector is innovation in state government. So as David said, I've been with DEP for 30 years, which is my entire career. But you know what? I, I don't know everything, and I'm not going to solve these problems by myself. I can't meet these challenges. DEP can't meet these challenges alone. I think we need to think deeply about different types of collaboration within state government. I think we need to really focus on the partnership to plug in that Jane mentioned and work in earnest to bring together all parts of state government to figure out what each agency's value added is, but yet stay in our swim lanes so that we're not creating overlapping duplicative programs. Some examples of how we're doing that already, the Board of Public Utilities is carving out a role for the utilities. So far, psc and and Atlantic City Electric have stepped up they are designing programs to fund what we call make ready for EV charging stations. So providing funding for all the behind the meter work that will enable uh, additional light duty charging stations to proliferate throughout the state. They are also planning to work with the utilities on doing similar programs for the make ready for medium and heavy duty charging infrastructure. So again, you know, BPU has, has a value added there because they have the direct connection with the utilities. And the Economic Development Authority is importantly working on supply chain issues and workforce development, trying, out, trying to figure out how to bring technology to New Jersey. And of course, DEP, we are working on grants for all types of things. We've given out millions of dollars for charging stations hundreds of millions of dollars for vehicle electrification, uh, working on policies, working on regulations. And then an interesting one that would not have occurred to me until about a year ago when it came to the forefront is our Department of Community Affairs. And I said, what does Department of Community Affairs have to do with electrification? Well, we had a, a vendor, a, an EV charging station vendor come to me and say, you know what, New Jersey has the longest permitting timeframe for electric vehicle charging stations in the entire country. And I said, okay, don't tell the governor, we're gonna work on that. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna fix that. So a uh, whole bunch of stakeholders and legislators banded together and passed in July a law that implemented first of its kind model ordinance, which was effective in every single municipality once it was issued. And that model ordinance essentially said 
that every municipality in the state is going to permit charging stations in this way. We are going to be consistent amongst municipalities and we are going to streamline that process so that we can get rid of that unfortunate headline of having the longest permitting times in the entire country. So that's another example of innovation. Unfortunately, it, it was triggered by a serious uh, concern by one of the vendors, but we were able to reach a solution. So again, it's, it's not just DEP, it's Department of Community Affairs, Board of Public Utilities, EDA, Department of Transportation, so many different people that need to be involved and we really need to think differently about how we work together. And then finally, I think we need to be creative about how we think about reducing vehicle miles traveled. Because not only do we need to electrify the vehicles that are on the road today, but we need to reduce the miles that are being traveled by those vehicles. We need to reduce the number of people in cars potentially. So we typically say, well, we'll just reduce BMT by getting more people on public transportation, getting more people on New Jersey transit buses. But I wonder if there are other ways to think about that. And that's the challenge that I would pose to this panel and to all of you listening out there today. I'm wondering if there are corporate sustainability models that we can encourage with our own employers, as well as with those in the private sector. As an example, perhaps a corporate sustainability goal could be to reduce the carbon footprint of the transportation that's resulting from that particular business. Can they encourage work from home? Can they install charging stations so that employees that drive electric vehicles can charge when they come to work? Can they turn over their own fleet to electric vehicles like this Chevy Bolt in blue, um, which is one of our DEP vehicles? And can they provide electric shuttles for first mile and last mile transportation for employees that are using public transit? Um, so again, I think thinking innovatively about how to reduce vehicle miles traveled, as well as electrifying the transportation sector, are both necessary goals. And speaking of sustainability, just as the previous session was ended, was ending, a question popped up um, in the Q&A that I wanted to touch on briefly. And the question said, are we getting ahead of ourselves? given the systematic issues with batteries, disposal, source of raw material from countries where the extraction is environmentally and socially destructive. So I just wanted to touch on that for a second because I think that really is all about this theme of sustainability. In New Jersey, the legislature introduced a bill um, that has to do with used batteries and battery recycling. It's similar to the uh, e-waste law that was passed in New Jersey several years ago. So for the um, anonymous person who asked this question, um, I don't think we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I do think we need to be absolutely um, cognizant and laser focused of the, on the effects that the supply chain for batteries might have on the environment in New Jersey. And we're very much working on that. And that is all for today. So David, I'm gonna turn it back to you and stop screen sharing. Thanks, Peg. Our next panelist is the Assistant Commissioner for Transportation Operations Systems and Support at the New Jersey Department of Transportation, Andrew Tenard. Andrew attended Virginia Military Institute where he graduated with a BA in history and received a commission as an ensign in the United States Navy. He earned his master's degree in business administration from Mary Wood University. Commander Tenard served in the United States Navy from 1989 to 2012 in both an active duty and reserve capacities. During his career, he was assigned to four ships and participated in various peacetime and wartime operations to include Operation Desert Storm, Enduring Freedom, and the coordination of logistical aid to Haiti. I welcome Assistant Commissioner Andrew Tenard. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm gonna to have to give someone an updated bio. I've also done some things here at DOT we need to kind of highlight. So it's, it's actually fun to be part of this today. Welcome everyone. I wanna thank the commissioner for her opening remarks. Um, I, was, I, I just looked at the uh, uh, show, you know, the show thing, the sequence, and I was worried I was gonna to have to follow Jane Cohen, which would have been a really tough uh, task to do. So I'm glad, I, glad we had that break. 
uh, so we can kind of hit the, hit the reset button. Um, but great comments by everyone. Um, Professor Kornhauser and I are going to tag team a little bit, but I'll kick things off uh, to describe some things. Um, first of all, it's great to have the band back together. Uh, we've been working on electrification, as has been commented by the, the thing. So Peg Hanna has been on that team, uh, Jane and several people from her staff, as well as people from Treasury and uh, uh, BPU. So it's nice to kind of um, get to showcase our work here a little bit. Uh, before we get into the details of the work we've been doing, um, I want to piggyback on a, a little bit of the uh, why that's been uh, discussed already. So in the commissioner's opening remarks, there was some slides showing the uh, recent damage from Ida, um, and that's very real. And uh, just a quick personal story, when that storm was occurring, uh, I went out and uh, was asked to go down to Gloucester County where the tornado had hit. And uh, while I was traveling down there, the uh, heavy rains were happening in the northern part of the state. And it was one of those moments where, uh, uh, you know, the state, you know, our backs were against the wall with everything that was happening. And I remember being down in Gloucester County and several of uh, our crews had shown up to uh, assess the damage. And it was, it was terrifying actually to see a tornado that um, a, 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 a level three tornado hit New Jersey and caused all that extensive damage to, uh, to those neighborhoods there. It was dark, it was raining. Um, all kinds of debris and trees were entwined with wires, and it was really pretty scary. And at the same time, uh, I was on the phone on the radios about um, road closures in North Jersey, people being trapped. Um, and I said something to someone I thought I'd never say. I, I said, you know, for once, I actually wish I was dealing with a snowstorm instead of this. I'll take a snowstorm any day over, over what we had to deal with, uh, Ida. And that's just a recent example. Uh, we've had uh, damage to our infrastructure, uh, significant damage on Route 22 and Bridgewater, Interstate 280, where a tractor trailer fell into a sinkhole, um, Route 63, where a retaining wall had uh, given way and collapsed into an apartment complex and displaced 10 families, um, which are still displaced, by the way. Um, so we've, we've had our fair share of uh, damages. That's the most recent one. But everybody will also recall Sandy and Hurricane Irene and Lee. Uh, Sandy damaged Route 35 and Irene and Lee, uh, Interstate 287. Um, so uh, we're sort of um, minor weather geeks here at DOT. And one of the things that I find a little funny, maybe disturbing at the same time, is a lot of new terminology, at least new to me, uh, weather terminologies. And, and we're, we see things like, uh, uh, bombo genesis or, or bomb cyclones. I'd never heard of those things before the last few years. So uh, it just drives home the point that uh, our planet is changing um, and we need to address it. I think we're speaking to the choir here, um, but it's happening. <clears throat> I think there's some good news though. And believe it or not, I'd like to take everybody back to uh, March, February, March, April of 2020. The beginning of the pandemic. I'm sure everybody uh, uh, can remember that. Well, I think one of the silver linings that we need to recognize, we need to talk about when everything got locked down, everybody hunkered down into their homes, we started working from home, nobody was traveling. Um, all of a sudden, as, as Jane had alluded to, the planet started to uh, repair itself. Uh, skies, you know, smog had cleared up, um, record low emissions. We watch traffic counts very carefully here at DOT. There was virtually nobody on the road. Uh, nobody was flying. And I think quickly we saw how, how quickly uh, Mother Nature can, can repair herself if she's just given an opportunity to do so. So if we can take nothing away from the pandemic, I think we had that window, those few months, um, where we saw firsthand um, uh, when we don't have uh, CO2 emissions or, or other pollutants going into the atmosphere, how quickly our planet can rebound, which is good news. <clears throat> um, I also think there's good news happening. Um, follow me here in, in sort of a perverse way with watching the gas tax. And I'm not going to get into that. That's for a different discussion. But one thing we watch closely here at DOT is the uh, revenues that uh, come in from the gas tax. That's, uh, that pays for a lot of our ability to take care of the infrastructure. 
Um, so over the last several years, there's been a lot of news about the increase in gas tax, uh, which nobody really likes to pay more when they, when they fill up their car. But in actuality, the uh, gas tax revenue that comes to the department and other transportation uh, people that use that has been relatively flat, if not declining, even though the revenues have gone up. Why? Well, cars are becoming much more fuel efficient. Um, and there's more and more electric vehicles, you know, getting on the road. So although, so it's just, to me, it's another indicator that um, uh, things are trending in a, in a good direction. Do we have a lot to do, a ways to go? Absolutely. We have a lot more to do, but it's, um, but it's not all doom and gloom. So uh, it's, it's, it's good stuff there. So uh, I'm going to share my slide. And I know comes right after me, Professor Kornhauser. Hopefully everybody can see that. There we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna address the first two slides, pause and, and uh, let our moderator introduce Professor Kornhauser. But this is the uh, opening page of our report uh, for statewide fleet electrification. Um, speakers up to this point have done a phenomenal job really kind of discussing things from a, from a high level macro uh, standpoint. And um, it can be kind of daunting, right? If we, if we really try to wrap our heads around the big picture, it can be rather intimidating. Um, I think what we've started to do is to break things into smaller pieces. And one was to create a very focused group, a focused effort to talk about the state of New Jersey, our, uh, you know, the state government, New Jersey, our light duty vehicle fleet and converting it to electric vehicles and how do we charge it? So this map represents the work. Uh, it's, a, it's a visual depiction of the work uh, we've done across the state agencies uh, and our partnership with uh, Princeton University. Um, what the green and yellow dots represent are the places, the locations, state locations, that we are recommending the state build out electric charging infrastructure. And if further on in the report, <clears throat> there'll also be a description of uh, uh, transferring or transforming our fleet over to electric vehicles. Um, when we started this, we started with the, with the DOT and the other transportation agencies, the Turnpike, New Jersey Transit, um, and SJTA. And then it expanded to uh, uh, the whole statewide fleet. Um, but the approach was pretty much the same. Uh, Professor Kornhauser will get into that a little bit. But we essentially looked at the driving patterns of the state fleet. Uh, the DOT was uniquely positioned because we managed the state's fuel system uh, for all state agencies, with the exception of a few, few fueling stations, but the vast majority is DOT. So we had a lot of data to look at where and how frequently uh, vehicles were being uh, fueled up. I think <clears throat> to speak to Jane's point about trying to think differently, um, a lot of people I think initially went into this project thinking, okay, well, we already have all these fueling locations, let's build charging stations at them. And then we quickly learned, well, that's not really how it's going to work in an electric vehicle environment. Um, if you recall, one of the, my favorite slides from Jane's presentation, she put up the slide from point A to point B, and then in between was a lot of you know, twists and turns and, and things. So what we focused in on in our group here is really point A and point B. Everything in between, I think, is going to take care of itself to a certain extent. We need to uh, do that. But we need to look at charging state vehicles where they spend the most amount of time, especially where they spend the most amount of time overnight. So this is a visual depiction of those locations based on driving patterns but it also assumes that um, uh, the state employees who have to drive vehicles will be um, uh, able to charge their vehicles out in the public, uh, the economy, whether it be a, a mall, a hospital, a Wawa, something like that. So we didn't try to kind of figure out the squiggly line part. We were focusing in on points A and B. <clears throat> I'll just go to the next slide. So there were two phases of the project. I alluded to this. The first one, the green one, 
was taking care of the transportation agencies. So the quantity of the uh, light duty vehicle fleet across those agencies was 935. And that was phase one of the project. It sort of naturally morphed into phase two with um, uh, the state central motor pool um, that treasury is mostly responsible for overseeing. And you can see the breakdown there of about 4,287 vehicles that are generally parked overnight or for extended periods of time at state locations. And then around 941, which are assigned to individuals. So here's the background, our objective and our approach. Um, we were guided by the executive order and the goals that have already been discussed uh, around 2025, and then 100% of the uh, fleet converted over by 2035. Um, we did the analysis, and, and, and quite frankly, the team from Princeton was phenomenal in taking some really sketchy data and uh, coming up with a phenomenal analysis to see our driving patterns. And I'll let Professor Kornhauser get into that in just a moment. Um, um, but we think we've laid out a framework that has now given uh, state agencies a plan to start moving towards these goals. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, at DOT, and I also know at DEP, we're uh, marching towards those. We have um, our first set of 60-ish um, plug-in hybrid vehicles on order. We expect those deliveries to start uh, next month. Hopefully the chip, um, Intel chip uh, situation is, is ironed out. That's what's delaying that right now. And we've actually already started to install a temporary charging capability here at the uh, Okay, so with that, I'll pause and uh, turn it back to the moderator for introducing Professor Kornhauser. Okay, thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Our third panelist is Professor of Operations, Research, and Financial Engineering at Princeton University, Dr. Alan Kornhauser. Dr. Kornhauser earned his BS and MS degrees in aerospace engineering from Penn State University and a PhD in aerospace engineering from Princeton University. He was a member of the faculty at the University of Minnesota where he applied automation, network analysis, and optimal control to the design of personal rapid transit systems. He returned to Princeton in 1972, extending his pivotal work to more conventional forms of transportation. He serves as director of the transportation program where he continues his basic research in transportation focused on the real-time operation of large fleets of driverless vehicles and on the development of deep learning neural networks that safely drive road vehicles. Today, he is particularly focused on the use of autonomous taxis to deliver affordable mobility to everyone, especially economically challenged households. Let's welcome Dr. Alan Kornhauser. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I think I went, uh, Andrew, can you remove your sharing your screen and I'll share mine, okay? So, and I'll pick up the slides. There should be a, a button that, or, uh, yeah. let's see, did, um, did my shared screen come up? Yep. I, uh, I'm assuming uh, you can all see this. Uh, this picks up uh, uh, basically just to, uh, to um, reflect on what Andrew said. I, I just find it um, uh, really good of what New Jersey has done here with respect to electric vehicles. Is basically the, the legislator and legislature and the governor have decided that if they're going to promote electric vehicles, maybe what they what they should do is is look at the vehicles they have 
themselves and and basically lead everybody and and in the passing of the legislation and the governor's executive order this is really what the what the public sector here in new jersey has done it said look we uh, we have these uh, uh light do this light duty fleet uh, we uh, we are promoting electric vehicles uh, maybe we should uh do ours first and basically this is what the commissioner pointed out uh, the 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 vision is to uh take the the fleet uh, uh, uh convert it to electric vehicles uh, 25 percent of them by 2025 and the whole 100 percent by 2035 and with that vision, now the question is, is how are you going to do that, particularly with respect to the charging of those, uh, those vehicles? Uh, one of the uh, big uh, uh, perceptive issues associated with electric vehicles has to do with the range anxiety. Essentially, everyone preceding me has mentioned that. So what we did is we looked at, at how the state was using its fleet. And uh, uh, while Andrew suggested that maybe the data weren't all so good, uh, we found them really pretty decent. And therefore, that some of the things that we were able to do is, is look uh, at fleet utilization characteristics. This is just but one of the charts. And what we see from that is a distribution of, of how far on average the vehicles go on a, on a day. There are very few that go a lot and a whole lot that go really what is, what is a few, especially with respect to the expected range opportunities that one expects to have with these vehicles. And we found that, that really the, the, the range anxiety associated in the use of it really shouldn't require these vehicles, except in a few occasions, maybe out in 2035 when we do them all, uh, to be recharged uh, during the day. That in fact, as um, as Andrew mentioned, that we could really look at at doing the charging overnight. The charges in the morning would easily should easily allow them to complete whatever duties they need to do with them without any anxiety, and return back to where the, where they uh, spend the night. Uh, and more so on that, we also realize that maybe they don't even need to be charged every day. So sort of the first thought was that we would need basically a plug for each car. And here we are looking at a fleet of 5,000, 6,000 vehicles, meaning 6,000 plugs. But really, in a sense, um, that's, that's not what, what uh, will be required. That in fact, maybe it should only be uh, once every three nights. And so on that, those kinds of, of, of aspects of it then completely um, uh, alter what kind of uh, deployment one does with those. And then given that we're going to sort of uh, progress through time in terms of the evolution of the fleet, uh, one one of the, and uh, conversion to electric vehicles, one wanted to look at really which ones are used, uh, are, are, are the oldest, you know, I guess we all sort of believe that we should maybe replace the older ones first, and which ones are, have high mileage. So, in fact, um, uh, we, we sort of love this representation of the whole fleets, basically in a grid that, base, that has uh, the mileage or the odometer mileage of each vehicle as to when it was purchased. And basically, the sweet spot of the ones that you want to do first are sort of down here in this lower left hand corner, and sort of the ones that you're, you'll do later are up there. And so, it gives us an idea in terms of, of how we're going to. Uh, progress through replacement of the fleet in terms of actually doing all of this. Our first doing of this was, was as, as Andrew mentioned, with respect to uh, the uh, transportation department's uh, vehicles, New Jersey DOT, New Jersey Transit, New Jersey uh, uh, Turnpike Authority, and South Jersey uh, Transit Authority. Uh, here we were dealing with a fleet of, of 935 vehicles, and uh, what we looked at was where are these, these are vehicles that tend to be parked overnight at the facilities. And so we looked at those facilities that they have there, and, and we inspected each one of those facilities, the A's that Andrew talked about. And what we found that, again, 
looking at those vehicles that are parked there or 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 or, or uh, spend most of their time there, uh, really uh, having a, a, a charging them once every three days was really what we should be looking towards. And then when we sort of looked at okay, uh, doing that and and um, and and uh, implementing the, the installment of the uh, the facilities, given that we're going to progress this over time, that in fact uh, what one should do in that in that expense process is maybe what we should do is is put shovels in the ground once, in other words, put the, uh, the electrification infrastructure in once, but only by the plugs as we evolve in time. And so that way, uh, you know, the, if you look at sort of the cost of, of, of building these things, you have the, the cost of putting in that infrastructure, and then you have the cost of each of the individual charging units. Again, uh, doing the upfront infrastructure once, because that is the expensive piece, is really the economically efficient way to progress through this. And in looking at this with uh, you know, and our, our cost benefit analysis, uh, uh, Andrew suggested, well, we really should compare the cost of, elect of, of building these charging facilities, the, the cost of, of the infrastructure and charging uh, and, and gasoline fueling facilities that one would have to, one does for that same size, same kind of fleet. So comparing uh, electric vehicle charging to um, um, uh, internal combustion engine charging, what we found is, is that the cost of, of the uh, of charging facilities for electric vehicles was 12% uh, to 20% of the cost of petroleum stations for the equivalent servicing capacity. So in some sense, uh, this is other good news for an evolution to EVs is that the charging, the, 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 the um, uh, uh, cost of the fueling stations actually for electricity is very much uh, less expensive than cost of building fueling stations for uh, internal combustion engines. Taking that information into account, we basically looked at each one of the facilities, the number of uh, each one of the A's, as Andrew put it, the number of vehicles that, that are, are basically uh, domiciled there or use those facilities, laid out in parking areas, uh, recommended places as to where those vehicles should be charged and, and where their parking facilities were. Um, we sort of uh, assigned them in, in, in physically in the parking structure, uh, sort of a premium parking area. How did we define the premium parking area? Well, we looked at where um, uh, handicap parking was, and we then went as close to the handicap parking as possible. I mean, you know, sometimes you sort of use some common sense, I think, in terms of of doing location design, and um, and of course making sure we don't uh, take the commissioner's parking. Not, not not I don't think we did that, did we, Andrew? I'm not sure, but no, we didn't do that. Uh, but uh, but that that was because it, it, we do have some choices in, in which to make that, and basically lay out charging, recognizing that in in terms of the details of what we did, recognizing that if we locate since the charging heads tend to have two plugs if we locate them sort of in the in the center of where four parking four vehicles can sit we have the opportunity to serve with two plugs all four of those vehicles but they don't need to be charged every night so therefore they can switch off appropriately which allowed us to deal with the details of that and also progressively uh, identify how many of these charging plugs we would need to, to meet the 2025 requirement and leave the rest to be acquired later to meet 2035. So we basically use that philosophy in terms of then deploying these and, and doing the sort of the preliminary design of each one of the facilities that we looked at. We looked at, we were dealing with a fleet of 
935 vehicles at 21 facilities. And out of this, we did a recommendation for each one of the facilities, estimated what the costs were, the number of level two, level three plugs, and so on and so forth, to basically provide a, a, a roadmap as to then uh, how to do the actual deployment and the construction of these things, to do the allocation of, of that complete fleet. We did this for the uh, for the you know, transportation fleet, the, the, the 900 or 1,000 vehicles associated there. And then in, in phase two, we then looked at the central motor pool agencies of Treasury, DEP, and all the other agencies um, of, um, of uh, New Jersey, which represented some 5,000 vehicles. Now, these 5,000 vehicles, when we investigated where do they domicile, where do they spend most of their time? About 20% of them are taken home. And about 80% are then distributed and parked overnight in, in all sorts of parking facilities. Uh, some with few, many, I should say, some facilities with many, many with few. And in a sense, in the beginning, we didn't want to go and say, my goodness, we're going to have to put, put infrastructure in, in all the facilities. Since this is a progression over time process that we're looking to do 25% by 2025 and, and, and evolve to 2035, we wanted to basically be able to address the 2025 issue, find the fewest facilities that we need that we can uh, uh, put um, infrastructure in to make sure we meet the 2025, but do it equitably across the various agencies and, uh, to, uh, and, and to do that. So in doing that, in that process of cutting back, again, uh, trying to minimize the, uh, the, the amount of, of, that has to be put in, we ended up coming up with the 21 facilities that we wanted to, that we recommend that the infrastructure be put in and to get the sort of equitable distribution across the departments because we know which department uses which uh, vehicles we didn't want to necessarily say each department has to be at 25 percent but maybe uh, you know at least there's no uh, no department should be burdened by more than 50 percent uh, it's hard to say the word burden at this point because some departments may think this is an opportunity and they want to do a, have all their vehicles. I would hope DEP it might be and it might in fact be one of those that says, "My goodness, by 2025 we want all of our vehicles." But again, that's part of the negotiations and so on that has to go forward. We sort of put a constraint on this that no nobody should be burdened because again, this requires change and and and, um, and Andrew will discuss. You know what needs to be done in terms of of the um, of the uh, implementation of all of this. But those were the kinds of trade-offs that we had to deal with and address that come up with with a reasonable um, um, aspect. So again, we uh, we picked uh, we we came down on these twenty-one, and uh, and also in dealing with where the these vehicles are parked, the, the, they're parked overnight at facilities that are owned by the state that are leased by the state or that are, um, I don't know, something else. There was a third category, I don't recall. And certainly it's, you know, the infrastructure improvements should first be done on own facilities, not somebody else's facilities and so on. So dealing with all those uh, aspects of the trade-offs that one has to deal with when with coming up with a, with a, with actually what are we going to do, uh, we took all those things into account. We had to have this equitable, you know, the equitable distribution of the electrification effort among departments and, and agencies was is key. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. So we reached this. Uh, we did provide this roadmap with the 21 facilities. Here are the facilities. They're color coded by whether or not they're owned, leased, or, or otherwise. Or I think these are New Jersey DOT facilities. These are um, these are I've forgotten what the colors are, but anyway, it's in the report. You can take a look at it. But we did those trade offs. A number of vehicles that are included in each, where they're located, and and so on and so forth. But to achieve the 20. 
25 numbers, we also had to have a buy-in from the 20% of the vehicles that are taken home. And so now the 25% of the vehicles that are taken home, how do they get charged? And that, uh, that leads to a whole host of other issues to implement that. To what extent is the charging at home going to be uh, reimbursed by the state or are, they, are, are those, uh, those vehicles to, to be charged in public facilities, to be charged in state facilities? And there's a whole section in the report about that which led, led us to the two reports that we, we presented, uh, the phase one final project report, which deals with the, with the four uh, transportation agencies and the phase two uh, report, with re, which deals with the electrification of 21 major facilities uh, for the rest of the departments. And then I turn it back to Andrew to say, now uh, we've come up with the what, we still need to deal with the how, um, uh, at, which is how to make this all happen. Right. And that's the point we're at right now. Thank you, Alan. It's a, a, that's great. So that's a great synopsis of the uh, two-phased approach, creating a framework for the uh, state uh, light-duty vehicle um, transition to electric um, vehicles by 100% by 2035. And this is the point we're at now. So we're working with BPU and the utility companies to do the make ready uh, work at those locations. Um, we're also uh, looking at the uh, incremental equipment budgets year over year and identifying the vehicles that are due for replacement. If you recall the lower left quadrant, the red quadrant, you know, those are the first candidates for um, vehicles that are going to be switched over to electric vehicles. So I think we have a, um, a, a map, a way forward to transition successfully to electric vehicles for the state uh, by, by the 2025 goals and then by the 2035 goals. And that's it. We'll turn it over back to the moderator. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner Tenard. And uh, Dr. Uh, Kornhauser, thank you very much for your thoughts. Next to speak is Spencer Reeder, Director of Government Affairs and Sustainability with Audi of America. Spencer was appointed in August 2018 and is based in Sacramento, California. That's where he's coming from right now, as a matter of fact. He got up very early to uh, be with us. In his position, Spencer is responsible for leading the Audi U.S. public policy voice on zero emissions vehicles, EV charging infrastructure, and associated energy sector issues in addition to providing overall leadership on the brand's sustainability strategy and initiatives. Spencer has a background in engineering, geophysics, climate science, and policy spanning academia, industry, and government. Just prior to joining Audi, Spencer led Microsoft's co-founder, Paul Allen's global philanthropic investments in climate, energy, and transportation. Early in his career, he held various research and engineering roles at the Boeing Company. Spencer holds a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Washington and a Master's of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Colorado. Welcome, Spencer Reeder. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to move relatively quickly through the presentation because I think there's probably some questions uh, for the panel, and, and I want to make sure that we provide ample time for that. I did. I did just want to start by uh, providing a little bit of context in terms of the number of vehicles we're talking about in New Jersey. I, I did a little quick internet research, um, and but first to commend the state for one wanting to lead by example because I think that is quite important. Uh, you know, these vehicles are plying the streets of New Jersey. Uh, your, your residents will see those vehicles. Uh, and, and I think it's a really important and, and good signal to send. Um, that said, uh, you, you sell about 480,000 vehicles every year. The, the registrations in 2019, if the, if the internet's correct, was, was 2.6 million uh, vehicles. So, um, so that's sort of the just, to, to orient everyone to the scale of the challenge as we think about electrifying the entire uh, on-road fleet. Uh, I'm gonna show a few slides um, and, and try to move those 
through those relatively quickly. Um, let me pull that up. Here we go. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so I start with this slide because it, it actually represents Audi's growing portfolio of all electric vehicles. Um, one of the things that I, I have to point out, uh, by Thanksgiving, when the Q4 e-tron arrives in the market in the US, Audi will have more all electric vehicle models than, than any other automaker. And I think some people are surprised to hear that. Um, but when I joined Audi a little over three years ago, I, the reason I joined the brand was because they, they were actually quite serious about launching into electric vehicles in a very serious way. Uh, you're hearing a lot of ambitious and aspirational statements from across the industry, which is great. Um, Audi made the commitment years ago to really transform our manufacturing base to start producing electric vehicles uh, at scale. Uh, so you see that, that manifested now in the market. Uh, with with a whole range of, of vehicles, which I'll I'll talk about a little bit. Um, so let me. Yeah, so this is the newest uh, electric vehicle. It's our most affordable, which uh, hopefully will be of interest to folks. Um, this is the Audi uh, Q4 e-tron. It comes in two different body styles. Uh, it is arriving as we speak. Uh, it's got a 240 mile estimated EPA range. Uh, we've got a quick charge, 125 kilowatts with the 82 kilowatt hour battery. But most importantly, I think for the market, um, because, because Audis are, are not always the cheapest vehicle uh, to, to choose from, this vehicle with the federal tax credit will come in at under $37,000, which is a great, uh, a great uh, entry point for someone wanting to get into an Audi all, all electric. And that's our, our, our rear wheel drive version. Um, so we've got it up on the website. You can go to audiusa.com and start to configure the Q4 if that's of interest. Uh, we've got a lot of other models as well. At the complete other end of the spectrum, um, what we call our Halo product. This is, is arguably our most expensive but most exciting car. It's the Audi e-tron GT. It was featured in a Super Bowl ad a couple of years ago. Those of you that watched the Super Bowl will hopefully remember that ad. Um, this is a, a high performance car. It was co-developed with Porsche. We're very excited. This is, again, what's going to show up on posters, hopefully in, in little kids' rooms as they aspire to, to a really cool sports car. So we have really vehicles now across the entire range of our portfolio. This is the Audi e-tron SUV. It was first introduced, um, launched globally in San Francisco in the fall of 2018. It's got a large 95 kilowatt hour battery, lots of range. It's a full-fledged SUV. Uh, we've also got a few plug-in hybrids. The Q5, the internal combustion engine version, is the is the best-selling Audi in the U.S. We have a plug-in hybrid version of that now. It's it's been really hard to keep in stock. It's a very popular plug-in hybrid, uh, and so this is all just a way of of saying that that Audi is is quite serious about electrification. We've got a lot of product. You can get it uh, get any of these at any Audi dealer in the country. We've got a a, a full-on national assault. Um, we also try to uh, make it easy for, for someone transitioning to the technology by offering seven days of free rental car service. Audi has a, a rental car operation called Silver Car. Those are co-located now with our dealerships in, in many locations. And so again, some a customer may come in and say, well, I don't really know if I'm ready to go all electric. We say, listen, you know, if you've got a couple long trips, you can come back, you can come back in, you can get a free uh, access to a Q7 or a Q5 or some other vehicle and, and take that long trip. Although we would argue with the infrastructure build out currently occurring across the country, 95% of those long trips are, are very uh, viable right now. So this is just a peek at the overall portfolio. You can see our, our battery electrics. Uh, we've got uh, that those on the right, we've got the three plug-in hybrids. And we've got six more coming uh, before 2024. Uh, I can't talk about the specifics there because they haven't been revealed yet, uh, but you're gonna see progressively Audi doing more and more. In fact, the last internal combustion engine new vehicle launch we will have will be in 2025. And that's just around the corner. So, so this is a, a full on transformation in our company. Uh, in fact, just to add some specifics by 2025, we'll have 30 uh, plug in electric vehicle models globally, 20 of those will be all electric. This represents 15 billion in investment just in, in Audi alone on electrification. Um, the charging we've talked a lot about, I'm not gonna dwell on that. Audi has put a lot of thought into the full ecosystem of charging uh, from anywhere from getting a customer actually to help them install the level two charger at their home 
with a partnership through QMerit. We provide standard equipment that offers a fairly high rate 9.6 kilowatt charging capability. And we've got an integrated partnership with Electrify America uh, with, depending on the model you buy, a minimum of 250 kilowatt hours of free charging that come with that vehicle purchase. Um, and, and Electrify America continues to build out. Uh, they've got over 600 uh, fast charging stations across the country. Uh, those are expanding every day. Those are high speed charging up to 350 kilowatts. So, you know, we think the infrastructure situation is improving dramatically. This is just a zoom in on the Northeast of Electrify America's network. Again, it's not just what happens in New Jersey because you, as you all know, people drive outside of the state. So it is really having confidence in the regional network. And I would encourage you all as you think, uh, think about this and talk about it to really think about it in a regional perspective. Um, the uh, the e-tron SUV, again, not to, to spend a lot of time because we're running short. Audi's philosophy is that we wanted to bring all of the attributes from our internal combustion engine SUVs to the electric vehicle portfolio. So we've got a tow package, we've got an operable sunroof, roof racks. Um, you know, we, we essentially put every feature into our electric vehicle that you would find in any Audi SUV, really to make that transition from the typical Audi product into our new line of electric vehicles much easier for our customers. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of outreach to our customers, trying to educate them on what's possible. This gentleman took his Audi e-tron, drove through the northern latitudes across North America, up into Canada, back into the Northeast. Um, so we're trying, to, we're trying to use storytelling and, and actually real stories from our customers to get people on board with the technology. If you go to our website, you'll see a lot of information about the electric portfolio. And, and finally, just to conclude, um, we're, we're part of the Volkswagen Group. Uh, the Volkswagen Group is making really, you know, betting the farm on, on this transition. Uh, you can see all the brands represented. Audi's obviously one of the main ones, uh, but across the, the group of brands, you know, we're looking at $40 billion investment just in electrification, uh, 75 models, um, you know, coming up uh, that are going to be electric vehicles. And that represents an aggregated volume of over 26 million EVs produced over the next decade. So, so again, we're, we're going for it. Um, I will say one thing just as evidence, uh, and we had some fun uh, with, with GM because um, they had had a, a Super Bowl ad with Will Ferrell and uh, we went back and forth uh, because they were talking about Norway. The number one selling vehicle in Norway in 2020 was the Audi e-tron and not just of, among electric vehicles, but of any vehicle at all. And, and those of you that know about the Norway electric vehicle story know that they are a highly educated EV market. And so we, we found that as a really important validation of the approach that Audi is taking with our electric vehicles, the fact that it was so uh, embraced in Norway. Um, finally, just two more slides. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of our testing and, and research and what we learn about electric vehicles in the Audi Sport area. So there's a, a formula racing series called Formula E. Audi was one of the early participants. We've had a lot of success there where we can test out some of the advanced technologies and electric drivetrains. And also now we're looking at the rally car series. And, and those of you that know the Audi brand and know the Audi Quattro technology know that that started in the late 70s and early 80s in rally racing. We are now the first automaker to deploy an electric drivetrain in the Dakar rally. This is the vehicle that will be competing in that, uh, and that's just in a few weeks from now. So uh, again, we, we're trying to push the envelope. Audi's tagline is Vorsprung durch Technik, which means progress through technology. We're really trying to drive this technology, push its limits so that we can offer consumer products that are gonna be really fantastic and compelling, and that's what we all need uh, to succeed. And, and the, Julia, who's following me, is gonna talk about sort of the ecosystem that needs to take place. Our job is to create compelling product and make, make it sort of like unavoidable. Uh, if you like Audis, you're gonna love our electric vehicles, but that alone doesn't solve this, this uh, challenge of converting 2.6 million registered vehicles in New Jersey to all electric. And, and, and Julie is gonna talk a bit more about what's needed. So look forward to any questions. Uh, hope that wasn't too quick and uh, thanks for the time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Reader. Outstanding. But just so everybody knows, I know we were a little short in the morning, early morning, and now in late morning, we're going a little bit long. So we are going to extend, just so everybody knows, don't panic. We're going to extend uh, this morning session to 1215. So lunch will be from 1215 to one o'clock. So no one has to panic at this time. We will get the questions. 
Uh, completing our panel this morning is Julia Reach. Julie is Vice President for Energy and Environment of the Alliance of Automotive Innovation. She spent nine years in the Environment and Energy Department of the Association of Global Automakers. Prior to 2011, Julia served as Senior Regulatory Engineer at the Hyundai American Technical Center. She also worked at the United States Environmental Protection Agency Office of Transportation and Air Quality as an Environmental Engineer. Julia has a master's in environmental engineering from the University of Michigan and a BA in environmental science from Northwestern University. Her present role, Julia engages in regulatory policy and advocacy at the federal and state levels on vehicle issues such as electrification and consumer awareness programs, fuel economy, greenhouse gas and criteria emissions, fuels and infrastructure and substance, substances of concern. I am pleased to introduce Julia Reach. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here and to join all of you. And um, I think it's just really important to have uh, events like this that are highlighting the great leadership that's happening in New Jersey to help address climate change and ultimately to help expand the market for electric vehicles. So Spencer did a nice job of laying out a company specific point of view about electrification, but I'm here today on behalf of automakers that produce about 99% of the new vehicles that are sold in the US. And Audi is one of the many automakers that are really all in, in this approach to in expanding electrification in the US. And in fact, our, our industry is, is estimated to spend over $330 billion in electrification in the, uh, through 2025. And this is really an unprecedented rate of spending and, and uh, efforts to innovate in our industry to bring cleaner, safer, and smarter transportation to the, to the US. Um, it will also result in going from about 50 models that are offered in the market today to a near tripling, uh, somewhere on the order of 130 to 150 models are expected by 2025. This means we're going to have electric vehicles available in nearly every shape and size and segment. There's really going to be a product for everyone, and, and we expect this really to lead to um, increased uptick in electrification in the U.S. But the reality is this is not... Uh, a one-stop shop, and it's not just about getting great models out there and great vehicles. It is also about making sure that we have a um, comprehensive strategy, both at the federal level and at the state level, to make sure that we are putting all the pieces in place to support this expanded electrification. Um, and uh, I, I know that this panel is going to extend beyond, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to stay on the entire time, but I'll just quickly highlight really three of the primary areas that we have been working on from a policy standpoint to help this transition to electrification. And so in this bucket of three items, the one that we continue to see um, be incredibly important are purchase incentives. And so that's uh, everything from the federal tax incentive to state level purchase incentives as well, because the reality is electric vehicles today do remain uh, more costly than a comparative gasoline vehicle. And it's really important that we have these policy mechanisms in place that help to equalize the cost and help customers see themselves in an electric vehicle. And we've really seen purchase incentives continue to be a persuasive policy mechanism for helping customers buy electric. Um, you know, New Jersey has put in place a fantastic incentive program. Uh, would love to see more money going into that program because the funds are quickly depleted, which means it's also working to drive more customers into EVs. In fact, um, in the uh, past year, we've seen sales of electric vehicles at a rate of around 3%, just shy of 3% in New Jersey increased to 3.5% for the first half of this year. And, you know, the the path that we're all on means that we really need to greatly increase those vehicles uh, sales in the year ahead. Um, another piece that we see really critical to the overall picture is uh, the need for more infrastructure. And as an association, when we talk about infrastructure, we mean both uh, charging infrastructure for battery and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, as well as hydrogen fueling stations for fuel cell electric vehicles too. Um, 
you know, really having a comprehensive picture of all the technologies that are needed to support a full electrification of the fleet and make sure customers have as many options as possible. But that also means having the infrastructure in place so that we can sell all of these vehicle types in a state. And right now, California is really the only state offering hydrogen fueling infrastructure um, to support fuel cell electric vehicles. From the charging standpoint, um, I think there were there were a couple points in uh, uh, the previous presentation that highlighted, you know, just in in one microcosm of a, a, a of a rollout for for fleets where where charging might be needed. We're looking at this for the entire state, for the entire nation, and there is no doubt that we need more charging. Um, capacity at homes, especially as vehicles increase their range, the ability to just plug into the wall may no longer be sufficient for fully charging a vehicle overnight. And so having level two charging capabilities built into homes, particularly new homes, is a really great opportunity for states as, as they're looking for ways to advance um, charging infrastructure. Secondarily, having charging available at workplaces or um, at uh, commercial or public spaces is increasingly important as customers want to see themselves no longer view an electric vehicle as a commuter or something to get the kids around for uh, you know after school activities, but really look at it as part of their full lifestyle. And then, um, and then of course, there are a lot of really um, challenging aspects of increasing infrastructure that that need really smart solutions at the table. And that's everything from making sure chargers are coming into every community uh, throughout the state, throughout the nation, and that um, and that the uh, capacity for charging um, Sorry, the, the capacity for charging is also growing at the same time. And that means having utilities uh, involved in what it is going to take to support charging um, for vehicles going forward. And then the third piece that we're really focused on as an industry is, is the manufacturing and supply side. The majority of the manufacturing sector for the auto industry in the US today is highly geared towards internal combustion engines. And we really need a lot of dedicated efforts and policies in place to make sure that we are helping our workforce and these facilities transition and into to be part of the electric future. The reality is as we sell more electric vehicles here in the US, we need the ability to procure the supplies of the critical minerals, process those, build the batteries, and ultimately manufacture electric vehicles here. This is just really critical to the future of the industry in the US, to the nearly 10 million jobs in the auto sector that are supported by, um, by our sector, and then ultimately for growing EV sales in a smart and comprehensive manner here in the US. Um, I think there's a number of other items that we can dig into. And um, and like I said, I'll be on a few more minutes, but I think Spencer has it really well covered as we dig into some of these important questions about what else it takes to get to electrification. Thank you. Okay, great job, outstanding. Thank you, Julia. Uh, we have some questions now. In fact, we got a lot of questions. We have questions coming in from all directions. So I'm going to start out with uh, the first question, which is, what equity impacts, positive or negative, could the electrification of vehicles cause? If one of the uh, panelists would like to respond. I'll take a shot at that. I think one of the things that Governor Murphy has made clear is that we need to clean up our grid. We need to have renewable energy right alongside of electrification. If we don't do that, there is the potential for increased emissions from energy production in some of our urban areas, thereby creating um, an equity disparity. I'm not, um, I haven't seen the data, so I don't know if there is an equity disparity currently. But I just wanted to emphasize that the renewable energy really needs to go hand in hand with all of the electrification that we're doing. I, I'd, I'd be happy to add on. Um, I think, you know, Peg's absolutely right. There's this really important aspect of the energy and where it's coming from. But another piece as automakers, you know, we 
we're prim primarily focused on new vehicle sales, but for electrification to be um, an important part of the future of, uh, of the vehicle fleet, we need to see electric vehicles going into all aspects of our communities, everything from new vehicles to used vehicles to even uh, fleet and mobility-based solutions that make sure that all customers have access to these fantastic technologies. Thank you, Julia. All right, I'm going to move on. Thank you. It leads me to my next question. What infrastructure and resources are required to support mass adoption? Would we be ready in, say, the next five years? Anyone? I think oh. that's a loaded question because I think we need resources in terms of policy, we need financial resources, we need market supply. There's we, we need so many resources. Um, I think when we think about infrastructure, a lot of people are concerned that, you know, the transformer in their block is going to blow up if too many of their neighbors buy electric vehicles. I think we still have a couple more years before we get to that point. I think the grid can handle um, a larger number of electric passenger vehicles in the average neighborhood. But I think we also need to be thinking about supply and demand and education of the consumers in order to build, build education and awareness and capacity. I don't know if we'll be ready by 2025. Yeah, I think yeah, there's a I lot of concerns that infrastructure continues to lag behind the vehicles. And there's, you know, in the past, there's always been this discussion about chicken and egg. Do you get the cars out there first and then the infrastructure or the infrastructure and then the vehicles? And you know, my answer to that today is they both need to be happening together. We can't just wait for one or the other to, to happen. And the kind of vehicle numbers that we're talking about increasing in the US, whether it's um, you know, something in the range of six to 8% sales through 2025 or something more significant like 50% by 2030, we really need to have a dedicated plan to make sure that infrastructure is rolling out um, at the same time. And as we look beyond even just the passenger fleet, there's a lot of even more difficult questions about capacity to charge medium and heavy duty vehicles, make sure there's enough uh, energy coming from renewable sources to support these larger batteries. And, you know, I just, I, I, I would make a call to action that having a plan in place now is the best route to making sure that we are moving in the right direction. Spencer, I heard you, and I see uh, Andrew, you also have your hand up. But Spencer, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, I was just going to give a perspective from, from Audi. I think Julia hit the nail on the head, and I think Peg as well. Uh, you know, it is decarbonized. I mean, you, you have nuclear in the Northeast. That's going to be a really important resource in terms of the energy mix. It's not just wind, wind and solar, of course. Uh, and, you know, our vehicles allow a, a customer to, to sort of program when it's charged. So, you know, in terms of the utilities and their relationship with EV customers, that's got to continue to evolve and develop and mature so that these vehicles can't, they have the capability so they can charge the time of day that's, that's best suited uh, for the electricity grid. That's one way to think about the infrastructure. But, but frankly, it's all of the things that, that Julia listed. It's the rebates. It's the education. We we still you know run into many of our customers who are who are really um, un, undereducated on the technology, and so we we are investing a lot. But that has to occur writ large. I think the state has a role. The utilities have a role. So there's there's I think as someone mentioned earlier, it is really working together as a community of of stakeholders, uh, and that's the only way you're going to get from the three and a half percent you're at now to the levels that people aspire towards. And I would just offer one final note of caution. The folks buying electric vehicles now are, are willing to take on whatever risks or uncertainties. You, you could see a plateauing of that, right? You, you may see some, some nice uptick, but once you hit 10, 15%, unless these systemic issues are addressed in a real thoughtful way, building codes, as Julia mentioned, I mean, really fully funding the rebates you're going to see a potential plateauing and a lot of disappointed stakeholders. So um, I think we all have to continue to work together. Assistant Commissioner Tenard. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I just wanted to piggyback. I couldn't agree more with what Julia said. And I think the, you know, coming up with a plan, I think there's going to be, and there should be, um, you know, kind of segmented plans. And, and I think we've, do, we've done that with the state's fleet. 
And when we sat down and presented it with, in conversations to our utility providers, and they're different ones across the state, you know, they didn't run out of the room. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, we can. And, and it just generated a conversation like we can do the make ready here. And, you know, the, the, the people can roll up their sleeves and, and start to build that out. And I think that's the model that's going to have to happen is uh, some type of an analysis. Will it look exactly the way the professor um, portrayed it? Probably not, but it's going to be pretty close. And it's certainly good enough that the utility companies can take that and run with that to do the make ready work. And we'll make adjustments as it, as it goes along, but we're starting somewhere. And I think that's the important part. Okay. Let's think for a minute on utilities and customer demand. Will vehicle to grid, V2G, vehicle to home, V2H, and demand response technologies and programs transform the role of the vehicle and how utilities manage the grid and customer energy use. Who would like to handle that one? I'm not sure I was we have anyone. Say, Dr. Kornhauser, I'd like to hear from yeah, you. Yeah, I'll, 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 uh, I, I think the easy answer is sure. I mean, you know, this is this is the marketplace, and the marketplace will respond. And 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 as has been suggested, you know that. This is this. These are new vehicles and then a re replacement of new vehicles, and that replacement takes o takes place over time. And I think what Andrew mentioned, I think we're preparing ourselves so they they, they mesh properly in their integration, and the and and we are appropriately planning and 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 looking to to work together on both the the chicken egg and and the chicken and the egg side. And that's the key piece of it, and and I think I think people should relax. It seems as if uh, the marketplace is working pretty darn well. Yeah, and on the on the V to G um, and V to home, uh, you know, listen, we're we're one automaker among many. Uh, we we've looked at this technology. Uh, I think probably in the medium and heavy duty fleet side, that makes the most sense because you've got a much more operationally manageable uh, source of kilowatt kilowatt hours uh, to deploy for a vehicle to grid application. A vehicle to home, I think is probably more realistic in the light duty fleet over time. There is cost associated with that in terms of some of the hardware and software. So again, if we're, if we're focused on making these vehicles more affordable um, in the light duty side for regular consumers, that may you may not see the vehicle to grid and vehicle to home emerge as broadly across the portfolios. Uh, there are going to be certain vehicles like, you know, not to advertise for Ford, but the Ford Lightning, that's a pretty cool pickup truck that's going to offer some vehicle to home. Audi's got, uh, Audi's got that capability as well, but we're always balancing, you know, what kind of additional cost are we going to put it in these cars at this point in time in the market? And I think as the professor said, you know, the market's developing, we'll, we'll all be able to respond. I don't think there's an engineering challenge to doing that per se. It's just a cost, you know, how can we best utilize what we've got? So. Uh, will the electric car battery serve double duty and become the centerpiece of demand response, vehicle to uh, grid, B2G, and vehicle to home systems, V2H? Anybody want to respond to that? Well, I mean, I think I provided at least our perspective, one answer, which is I think it's the medium and heavy duty, uh, potentially uh, government fleets or corporate fleets that are parked overnight, those are the, the type of vehicles uh, and vehicle fleets that are probably best suited for that. Our, our view is we don't think a privately owned light duty vehicle is probably gonna have a major role in that. Um, but, but you know, we don't know. I mean, one can look at the, at the utilization of the energy and when you need it at home and when you need it in your battery and in your car when you're moving and things like that and do some energy balance with all of this. But, but I th again, I think the marketplace will, will, will allow that to happen when, once it becomes 
economically appropriate for the individual to participate. Spencer will make the vehicle that uh, will do it and so on. So I think I, th th there are some theoretical things that we've all looked at that, that can do that, that can balance it all out because, you know, part of the energy problem is it bounces, you know, throughout the day and, and, and it's tough to store electricity and the, the, the hard part to store it is in the battery and, and, um, you know, and, and but those, I think the marketplace will find those. I don't think there, and maybe some technological breakthroughs will also uh, allow to do once we get farther along the evolution curve. Okay, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but I do want to get someone from uh, that's listening to this presentation. And Rob S. says, where are the electric trucks? Who wants to cover that one? The electric trucks. Kind of a little bit of a curveball. Anybody? Oh, uh, Elon uh, claims he's making them, and then you know, Nikola pushed one downhill. So I, I, you know, um, 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 I guess they'll come. <laughs> they're they're coming. We uh, we don't make trucks, uh, obviously not yet. Um, Volkswagen Group. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, it's, people, it's, some people have asked us to, but I don't think you'll see an Audi truck. It, it, it's a big, it's a big power problem. I think if we if we address the light duty fleet first and so on, again, the marketplace will not, it should readily take care of that. Well, again, I'm not here to to shill for my my competitors, but Rivian does have a, a truck that just entered the market. Ford's got theirs coming. There there are trucks coming. Yeah, on the on question. the pickup side, sure. There's the there's Elon's whatever, and and the but Ford F-150, you know, some suggest that Ford's betting the ranch on that one. That was a wonderful source of information. Thank you very much to our experts for sharing their thoughts and time. Thank you all very much. We're now at the moment in our agenda where we honor some very deserving individuals for their contributions to innovation, research, and implementation. I am pleased to welcome Amanda Gandek, manager of the NJDOT Bureau of Research, to present the 2021 NJDOT Research Showcase Awards. Amanda has a bachelor's degree in environmental science from Stockton University and a master's of environmental policy from NJIT. She began her career in the private sector, but joined NJDOT, where she spent 14 years working on environmental clearances for various transportation projects at New Jersey Department of Transportation prior to transitioning to the Bureau of Research in 2015. Amanda is the state representative to TRB, a voting member of the AASHTO Research Advisory Committee, and an executive member of the State Transportation Innovation Council. Under Amanda's leadership, the New Jersey STIC received the 2019 STIC Excellence Award for fostering a strong culture of transportation innovation. I will turn the agenda over to Amanda. Thank you. So first I wanna quickly express a special thank you to Pragna Shah of my staff for her hard work on this event. Not only is she my right hand, she's the lead for the annual showcase and works extremely hard with Janet Lelly and her team to ensure the event is a success. So these two ladies deserve a big round of applause and much recognition for their uh, hard work. Next, I can't go without acknowledging the rest of my dedicated staff for their contributions. We may have spent another year partly behind our screens, but your work has not gone unnoticed. So thank you to my assistant, Stephanie Knopf, our contract administrators, Sue Rizzo and Sneha Shah, our librarian, Tammy Yaden, and our research project managers, Stephanie Patapa, Priscilla Ukpa, Yuri Venkatila, and Diane Thompson, who is also our program specialist. So now for the awards. I'm honored to recognize the hard work and innovative thinking of our students, researchers, and employees of our transportation partners. These award recipients have logged countless hours in the classroom, the lab, out in the yards and garages and on the roads to develop innovative solutions to complex transportation problems problems that affect every one of us as users of the Garden State Transportation Network. So first, I'd like to present the Outstanding University Student in Transportation Award to Wei Huang. 
Wei is a student researcher in the Re Rutgers Civil and Environmental Engineering PhD program with an impressive cumulative GPA of 3.82. Wei's outstanding contributions to the NJDOT sponsored project titled Implementation of Porous Concrete for Sidewalks in New Jersey include the development and analysis of several different types of porous concrete designs, the development of computational models, literature searches, development and testing of eco-friendly geopolymer binders that reduce the carbon footprint of, of porous concrete and assisting with the field construction of a pilot sidewalk segment that will be used to study long-term performance and field deterioration. Wei has focused on green materials and sustainable infrastructure while strengthening his knowledge and skills in the areas of lab experiments, statistical data analysis, and numerical model development. Wei is currently working as a leading student researcher on a Port Authority of New York and New Jersey project that aims to develop low carbon concrete technology for bridge deck, pavement, and building. He is also working on another NJDOT sponsored research project relating to advanced reinforced concrete materials for bridge deck applications. Finally, his research efforts have resulted in several co-authored journal papers in the last five years and a fellowship by the Geosynthetic Institute to support his research proposal entitled Investigation of Geocell Reinforcement for Mechanical Performance Improvement of Porous Concrete Pavement. So congratulations, Mr. Huang, and I wish you all the best as you continue making valuable contributions to the transportation research community. Also, as a reminder to everyone, don't miss this presentation after the break during the poster session. Next up is our 2021 Best Poster Award. Each submission was rated on innovation, implementation, and presentation. This year's winner goes to Xiao Chen of Rutgers University for his poster titled, Hot in Place Recycling of Asphalt Pavement, Current Practice and New Technology. Mr. Chen collaborated with Rutgers Associate Professor Hao Huang and NJDUT Bureau of Pro uh, Research Project Manager Giri Venkatila. The use of infrared heating is the current practice for hot in place asphalt recycling. However, this research evaluates the potential applications of microwave heating. The team assessed current practices, evaluated new technologies using lab experiments and numerical modeling, and demonstrated several benefits of using microwave heating. Be sure to tune in later in our program where you'll have a chance to see this research poster up close and hear Mr. Chen explain the details and benefits of this new technology. You'll also have a chance to ask him any questions you may have. Congratulations, Mr. Chen, on a job well done. Next is our 2021 NJDOT Research Implementation Award. <clears throat> this award goes to Husam Najim, Hao Wang, John Henkin, Hardik Yagnik, Xiao Chen, and Wei Huang of Rutgers University for the NJDOT sponsored project titled Implementation of Pervious or Porous Concrete for Sidewalks. This Rutgers team worked with NJDOT Bureau of Research Project Manager Priscilla Ukla and the NJDOT Materials Bureau is the research customer. Pervious or porous concrete has been gaining popularity as a potential solution to reduce impermeable surface areas, reduce puddling, and potentially slow high flow rates of stormwater. However, there are concerns about the structural support and longevity for the expected life service, service life of sidewalks, not to mention life cycle costs. To collect and measure data on short and long-term performance, a 200 foot long segment of porous concrete sidewalk was built in May, 2021 as part of the Skillman Road Pathway Project in Montgomery Township. Monitoring activities will include visual inspection of surface texture, clogging, and raveling. Periodic infiltration tests to measure variation of infiltration rates over time, and pouring a few sample to cylindrical pores measure void ratio and compressive strength in the lab. 
Congratulations to Dr. Najim and his research team. Last but not least, I'll be presenting the winners of our 2021 Build a Better Mousetrap competition. This year, we'll be awarding one state agency and one local agency. Whether it's a new gadget that improves the quality and safety of a project or an innovative process that reduces costs and improves efficiency, it's typically the people on the front lines who discover the latest and best practices on how to do their job better. Entries were judged on cost, benefits to the community, ingenuity, ease of transferability, and effectiveness. The State Agency Build a Better Mousetrap Award goes to Mark Franco for his tire centerline bracket. Mr. Franco is a New Jersey Transit Technical Specialist of the Bus Materials and Technical Support Division. While learning how to install, install snow chain systems on their bus fleet, Mark and his coworkers were taught by the snow chain manufacturer that finding and using the center line of the tire is crucial to the system working properly. Mark noticed that the mechanics installing the system were having trouble duplicating the manufacturer's center line method, resulting in inaccurate measurements. That's when Mark brainstormed the idea for the tire center line bracket. Using a scrap piece of steel, bending the ends, ends at opposing 90 degree angles, he marked the center of the bottom bend and set a magnetic digital level on it. After placing the other end inside the wheel, Mark was able to easily find zero and match the center line that the manufacturer marked. The manufacturer found that Mark's innovative center line method was much easier and approved its use. Now the installation and maintenance of the snow chain systems will be uniform and accurate across NJ Transit's 16 garages keeping the system working properly to get riders to their destination safely during inclement weather. Congratulations, Mark and New Jersey Transit on becoming our state agency Build a Better Mousetrap winner. Finally, the local agency Build a Better Mousetrap Award goes to Art Villano of Montgomery Township for the Inlet Repair Trailer. The task of stormwater inlet repair requires saws, various hand tools, concrete, basin block, bricks, wood for forms, water for concrete, concrete mixer, and a way to lift the heavy grates. To eliminate the amount of equipment required and repetitive climbing up onto trucks, an older trailer was converted into a repair trailer. A generator, electric cement mixer, electric crane, electric water pump and water storage tanks were mounted on the trailer, which also has electric outlets and room for pallets of concrete, basin block, lumber, and other tools. The labor to complete the project was around 100 hours and the overall cost was about $3,500 for materials. By having all equipment and tools in one place, the number of repair vehicles went from three trucks down to only one. In addition, Working off a low deck trailer eliminated climbing into the truck bed and the electric crane eliminated heavy lifting of the grates. Congratulations Art and Montgomery Township for becoming our local agency Build a Better Mousetrap winner. With that, I'd like to wish one last congratulations and say thank you to all of our very deserving 2021 award recipients. Okay, great. Thank you, Amanda. Congratulations again to all the winners. We will now break for lunch until 1 p.m. After lunch, feel free to move between the four breakout sessions that will be going on simultaneously until 2.30. Enjoy your lunch, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>